Hey there, it's Andrea, and welcome to the Voice of Influence podcast. I am so thrilled to have with me today Finka Yurkovic. Yurkovic, it's Yurkovic, not Yurkovic. You, no, I'm good either way. Yurkovic, Yurkovic, because in Croatian we say Yerkovic. Ah, Yerkovic. Yerkovic. So I could do that. Yeah, there you go. So you go Finka Yerkovic, and then you're like right on point. <laughs> it's just a fantastic name. And you're a fantastic person. Um, so I've known Finka for. Oh, golly. A long time. Pretty much the life of my business at this point. Um, and I am, I've had her on the podcast before to talk about another book of hers. Probably, I don't know, just one, I think two other times. But it, I mean, we've been around for almost six years, Finca. I know. I've been doing this for yeah. six years. Yeah. So um, this time, though, if you're watching a video I'm going to show you, we have her book, Transformational Selling. Hold oh on, my gosh, I have mine so, too. So excited. So excited to jump in. Okay. So I, you're so excited. It was like, let's not even talk. Let's just jump right in. I know. I was like, we cannot try to catch no. up or anything. I want to, yeah, I don't, I don't, I don't want to waste any of the, the juiciness. Okay. So first of all, Finca, um, would you tell us what you're doing in your business right now? Like what? What are you doing? Who are you? What are yeah? What are you up to? So, what am I up to? Um, I help uh, sales leaders and sales teams elevate the quality of the work that they're doing uh, amongst each other and with their clients. Often, what happens is um, we are, you know, charged to sell certain products and services. And what we want to be thinking about is we're not actually selling products and services. We are helping our clients uh, be, do, and have more of what they're seeking. And so um, my work is primarily uh, working with organizations. Um, I do come from a, you know, two and a, two decade plus five years uh, experience in the financial services world. And uh, my hope is to elevate the conversations that, um, you know, advisors, bankers uh, are having with their customers, that it's more than a mortgage, a mutual fund, uh, an investment product that they're selling. They're, they're actually helping their clients uh, be more financially healthy, wealthy, and wise. Now, this whole uh, idea of transformational selling. It's broader than financial services. Uh, so for me right now, um, the place that I've just really thoughtfully determined that I would uh, you know, just start doing this and focusing this work on uh, would be primarily in that financial space. But again, I work with uh, consultants, e-commerce firms, uh, so various industries uh, all in, in all spectrums that anywhere where you find sales at you know, health services and medical and pharma. Uh, but for primarily, um, yeah, it's it's all about people who, you know, they they want to sell, they want to help, but they get stuck and they're like, I, I don't, I don't want to sell. Like I know I've got to get this thing out in the world, but I don't want to sell it. And it's like, you don't have to sell it. Uh, let's actually change your mindset of what you're doing and and give you some tools on how to approach it in this way. Um, cause it's not only a mindset thing, uh, mm. there's things you've got to be doing to, to deliver on becoming a transformational seller. Yeah, I, uh, definitely needed that because, you know, when you're, w when you have an idea, when you have a message, you have to be able to sell it and mm -hmm. influence is, you know, this is a voice of influence podcast. I mean, we, we focus a little bit more on not not as not on selling the product as much as selling the idea or the the change but it's still like even at that level a lot of people struggle to know how or what to do or even to get past their own i don't want to tell people what to do or mm -hmm. i don't want to feel slimy i don't want to um yeah, especially with the selling the product, especially when money comes into the situation, into the picture. Um, and that's that's, of course, been a hard thing for me. Um, of course, I say, because if anybody knows me, they know that would be hard. So <laughs> but I, I think I think that working with you and and doing some other things that have really helped me to understand just going out there and doing it enough to realize that 
if you don't charge enough for a product, it's not going to be taken seriously. If you mm-hmm. don't, if you don't put yourself out there, you're not going to have a shot at getting anything back. I mean, you have to do the work. So anyway, I um, am so excited about this book in particular. Like I, I loved Sell From Love and the concept behind it, the ideas in it. And then it seems to me like this book takes that and like helps you really put it into play. What would you, how would you describe the relationship between the two two books? So the, um, the framework is the same, meaning uh, there are these three pillars that we're always focusing on. The first is um, really showing up in your authentic self. So that aligning to authentic integrity, the second being how do we have the ability to put ourselves in someone else's shoes and see the world from their point of view? And then the third being, you know, the things that we're selling, it's not a product or service. It's actually here to make a meaningful change in the world, uh, be it to the person that it's going to benefit from it or in your community or how your business makes money and how you reinvest and all those wonderful things. Um, so those are the same things. The difference was I was really looking at this book uh, from a really practical, like how do you put Like we can all read this beautiful books out there, but I'm also about action. (laughs) Like, how do we like take these wonderful ideas and say, okay, now what do I do with these ideas and how do I put them into play? And so the book uh, has eight specific habits that will help you, you know, build and have better relationships with your clients, um, help you grow your business, but it is very much action focused. And so the book comes with a planner and each of the chapters. So you can go week by week with the chapters, but it's really about, all right, let's take the first idea, the first habit. How do we approach? um, So when we get stuck and, you know, it feels icky, it feels slimy, it feels like I'm pushing on something. Well, often what's happening is there is some fear energy going on in there. We're either self-identifying with our product or service and we're, you know, focused on ourselves more than on the person. Uh, We might be experiencing doubt, fear. We might just, you know, woke up this morning. I'm not feeling at my best. And unfortunately, that's also going to affect how you show up. So the first habit is, you know, how do you distinguish? Are you coming from a a fear-based energy or a trust and love-based energy? And just becoming aware of, oh, today I'm feeling off because, you know, I, I slept five hours instead of my eight hours or I'm dealing with a headache or I've got this really a big high stakes proposal I'm working on. Like over the last two weeks, I had an RFP that I was working on for a big corporate client. And I had to put pause on a couple of things going on in my in my world. But even that amount of energy in a project um, such as, and you know the experience of putting a very complex, um, you know, high ticket <laughs> proposal together, um, there's a lot that goes into it. And so all of a sudden that can actually affect how we're showing up. And so that's habit number one. Where are you right now? You know, where am I today? I can just be just do a quick check in. Ah, all right. I'm on a on a scale of one to five, five being I am so in my zone. I'm so allied to love energy or one is I'm, I'm really in that fear zone. You just take a pulse check. Oh, I'm at two and a half today. And I know the contributors. I know what's going on. And then we go off and we go on with our day. And, you know, the rest of the habits really start to then inform what are the next things that you do. And uh, yeah, this book is just all about action all about taking some really beautiful ideas and saying, okay, what can you do with these ideas to help you put yourself out there? As you said, get your message out there, sell that idea. Like even if it's an idea, um, I I love ideas. Like I'm an ideas person, so I'm always selling ideas. So right now we're selling the idea of become a transformational seller. Use these eight habits to help you get there. Mm, Yes, 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 yes. So yeah, fear fear and love that's a huge theme for me as well and so um i do think that there's so much that it's easy to get driven by fear and one of the things that you do in this book is you help people to um interrupt those patterns that they have um that that are just sort of set inside of themselves like to run away from things that they are struggling with or the things that cause fear so that you don't get stuck in that pattern and instead you're interrupting it and then being able to do something, choose something different, which I want to say is I think people don't realize when they are, when they're being driven by, when we, when we're being driven by our fears, it means that 
we don't actually, we're not exerting agency. We don't have a choice because we're being driven by a fear. So we feel like we want to go run away, but that's not an actual choice that we're making. Instead, we're like giving in to the fear. And so by, by putting these practical ideas in here and giving people a chance to really think through, you know, how am I going to respond to that fear? It actually ends up making, uh, giving somebody more power, more choice. They, they become more empowered. Absolutely. You would say about that. So I run, um, I also run a, a business um, accelerator uh, coaching group and every quarter we do sales planning. And so each of them are working on their own businesses and figuring out what's their priorities for the quarter. And um, a couple of things I want to say. One is when we, uh, so another habit in transformational selling is doing things, we call them edge moves. So there's the comfort zone, which we're familiar with. There's beyond the comfort zone, the things that like totally trip you up. But what's that sweet spot in between? Like, what's the bridge? What's that next step that you can be doing to help you get closer to that ultimate goal? That might not be tomorrow, it might be three years, five years, or 10 years from now, but where you are today and where you want to go, you know, in that longer term, it, the, the, the gap is so big. And all of a sudden we want to do everything, then that overwhelms us. And that's all fear energy. That's all fear energy. And so then that debilitates us because you can't do everything all at once and we're overwhelmed and then we do nothing or we procrastinate. So part of our sales planning process is really also, you know, we're very cognizant of choosing edge moves for the quarter. So what's an edge move you're going to do? And we sit before we even embark on that edge move, we start to, we actually talk about what are the potential um, fears that might show up in this quarter as you embark on this? What are ways in you, in ways you could mitigate this fear? And how are you going to be towards yourself when it shows up? So we are not in denial that you are not going to, um, are the term we use, a te very technical term called squirm. <laughs> so we say we're squirming. So you know what it's like when you're putting and producing a podcast, when you're putting a proposal out, when you're writing a book, there's a ton of squirming going on because that's the discomfort. And so what we know is, especially when we're selling, there's going to be a ton of squirm. And so what we're actually doing is forecasting the squirm that's going to happen in the quarter. Let's actually call it out. Be aware of it. What are some of the things that might happen before it happens so you know it's coming? And um, how can you, you know, pre-plan it? Again, obviously, it's not good. We're not built like, you know, the Timex watch. It's not going to work on cue, but we're going to be that much more prepared for it because we've planned for it. And then, so yesterday, for example, uh, so we do Q2 planning. And so everyone, we just, we're just finishing Q2 planning um, and Q2 starts uh, after today. So we're just finishing Q1. And so uh, we start Q2 planning two weeks before the quarter is up. And yesterday, everyone, all of the uh, business owners running their own businesses uh, came in and they presented their Q2 plans. And so now not only are they they're presenting it to this group of peers that they work with. But what was also really cool was uh, one of the uh, the people, he ended up, um, he's he started going through his uh, Q2 plan and it was just so beautiful how he just like went over. He's like, well, that was something I had in Q1. I didn't do it then, but we're going to try again this time. And what I loved and everyone else kind of also, uh, you know, acknowledged it. It was like the other thing that fear will do is it will beat us, beat us up, meaning, oh, man, I didn't do that thing I said I was going to do. And and then we we compound it with more, you know, punishment in our head or we debilitate ourselves even more. What I loved about what he said and how he approached it was, well, that didn't happen in Q1. Let's go at it again in Q2. And so the the premise behind us is that you know sometimes we have the best intentions to get a whole lot of stuff done and then when we start putting things into practice and into play we realize we've actually been overly ambitious or something else came in and, and interrupted our plan but this lightness about our plan um and that's a love based approach when we're heavy and punishing ourselves again that's fear in it so 
comes in so many ways that, you know, so, you know, the, the easy ones are like, I'm doubting myself, I'm procrastinating, I'm not putting myself out there, but it shows up in so many other ways that we've got to be really cognizant of, you know, how do we call it out before it could happen day by day? And then when it does happen, how do we be with ourselves when it does? So, yeah. And let's just say like, this, it's amazing if you can do this in business, <laughs> imagine what it will do for you in your life. <laughs> Absolutely. I think our, our businesses are beautiful ways of growing ourselves because then, you know, years ago, this is like probably mm, almost maybe 10 years, actually 10 years ago, it was 2013. I took this course and they had these like, you know, you can focus on your business. You can focus on your creativity, your relationships, your health and well-being. And you could pick any area, but they wanted you to pick one area. Because no matter if you just pick that one area and you shift that one area, the natural ripple effect is all the other ones come with it. Mm. So the same with our business. So we've, we've, I've consciously, you've consciously chosen that I'm going to self-actualize myself through my business. And then what happens is as a result, I show up, I, I need to elevate my leadership or my relationship with my husband. Cause now all of a sudden, you know, there's certain um, ways in which we are being together because I have to show up a certain way in my business. There's uh, a certain way that I want to be showing with the rest of my fam family relations. Like it, it just, it goes everywhere. So it's, the business is a beautiful place to become more you. That's for mm. sure. Mm. Love that. Can we go, um, let's, let's go back to transformational selling and kind of <clears throat> dig into that a little bit. Um, one of the things I really appreciate your uh, about your book is just how visual it is. I'm going to, again, if you're watching on video, you can see pages that I'm holding up are just like, we've got all kinds of charts and graphs and I always appreciate a good framework, you know, all that kind of stuff. Um, and you're talking about the difference between trans transactional selling and transformational selling on page 13. Mm -hmm. Actually, one, one of the things I really appreciated was the additional relational aspect, the relational selling. I was like, ooh, I get stuck there sometimes. Mm -hmm. um, so why don't we actually go, what's the difference between transactional selling, relational selling, and transformational selling? So the core of the difference is transactional selling really focuses on the product we are selling, the product or service. It's on that piece. Relational selling focuses on the relationship between you and I. So the person selling and the person buying. Transformational selling focuses on the outcome, the relationship and the transaction will create. And ultimately, the way I like to distinguish them is transactional selling talks about product, price, and features. Relational is all about know, like, and trust. So again, another very familiar uh, term. And then transformational selling is all about be, do, and have. Who are you going to be? What will you be able to do? And what will you have? Because you chose to work, we chose to work together, or you chose to buy this solution. Now, it doesn't mean that transactional and relational selling aren't important. They are. But often what happens is we focus too much on the transaction, meaning when we go to sell our service or our product, we are selling the product or service. We talk about, you know, how much, um, you know, it, it comes with I, I, even the work. I like I always go into the workshop and training space. I always think of, of the, the workshops and, and the trainers or even like I'll go in financial services. I'll do both examples. Workshop leaders and, and trainers will start talking about it's three workshops, uh, three hours each. Uh, there'll be about three activities in each. Um, so we just really stop talk about what's the like what the transactional details um, where a financial service person might talk about the mortgage rate, the term, is it variable? Is it fixed? So we're really about, again, the product. So we're so focused on the product. Um, where relational selling then focuses on you and me. So we're, we're talking about how is the ball game? Um, you know, what you guys do this weekend? We're just really focused on rapport and the relationship. And then you can often have um, these conversations 
happen. And, you know, you've got an hour booked with a client and like 45 minutes in, you're still building rapport. And the client's like, okay, when do we get, I have, I have to get on with my life, but I got business here to talk about where, and some will call you out right away. Like I, I know I've been in meetings where I'm, I love to do a rapport and relationship building and I can spend 10, 15 minutes in the beginning. But if I have a client um, that I had, didn't read correctly, you start reading them a lot better when you figure this out. You're like, oh, they're getting impatient with me. I better state the goal and objective of this meeting and the outcome, and then let's get right into the business. And we might have some personal things in between, but they might right need to get right into business uh, right away. And so that's that's being mindful of that. The transformational seller, um, you know, they walk in not really caring about the product and service they're selling. The relationship is definitely important. But the focus that they have are on the four key transformations a client is looking for. And so there are four key transformations. I, I like to look at them in a grid, like a matrix. The first is they have problems that they need solving. The second is they've got goals that they want to achieve. So those are short term. And then underneath that, they've got values that they want to align to. And then they've got dreams that they want to fulfill. And our job as transformational sellers, all we're really doing is showing up, being very present, asking like, oh, like over the top, amazing questions that your clients are like, oh, I never thought about that before. Mm -hmm. Oh, you're making me really think right now. Like you want them to squirm because you're asking really good questions or like, I haven't thought about that. And then you're like, that's okay. You can take your, all the time you want right now or think about it. And then we can pick up, you know, at our next meeting next week. But you're the person that gets them to think. And the only way you get them to think is by really being an, you know, I don't even an attentive, a present, a mindful listener that you're paying attention, not only to what they're saying, but you're sensing in their energy and how they're feeling. And you're, sometimes we get these shots of, oh, something's wrong here. Like you get that intuitive hit and then we like discount and don't ask about that thing. Like, oh, that's nothing. Actually having the courage to ask those questions because you're probably onto something that they're also aware of, may not know, but like, how do we create those types of experiences? And ultimately, once you uncover their problems, their goals, or their values and their dreams, like I, even that, I'll go back to that RFP that I was working on for the last couple of weeks. Um, the second page to the RFP, I literally write out the transformation you are seeking. And I put the whole grid, the problems, the goals, your values you want to live up to as an organization. And uh, instead of dreams, I used aspirations for them. But I, I literally, is this, this is what you're looking to solve for? Make sure that we're all on the same page. And then, um, and then at the end, you know, who do they want to be? What do they want to be able to do? Like there are certain behavioral things they need to be doing. Um, like what's going to be the thing that they're going to put into action, just like us? And what are they going to have as a result? And that, that's, all, that's what a transformational seller is looking for. And the beauty of it is um, you realize that you're not selling. And at the end, you know, you're not selling anything. You're looking to understand them. And once you do, either you get the business because you're the only one that actually took the time to understand and help them excavate all this stuff that they're looking for that they didn't even know, or you help them find the right solution. And that might be you, or it might be your colleague. You might be able to do a referral or it might be something or maybe nothing at all. Like your client might be on the right track, but wow, wouldn't it be awesome if they knew that and you were the one that were, was able to help them have that conversation? Hmm. Yeah. Yeah. I think that, uh, I think that that's really powerful. I certainly want to work with people who actually seek to know me and what I want and not just like kind of make assumptions and recommendations and back off. I don't like that. Um, I also, and yeah, can ahead. I just say something to that? It'll also be the way we differentiate ourselves with technology mm -hmm. because even though, and I get the algorithms and I get the personalization um, that's happening, you know, it's been happening for years, but it's going to get even more sophisticated with uh, AI and, and all those advancements. Um, and, and, you know, I think it was yesterday I heard this. Someone said, like, they're, it, it knows you better than you, and it'll predict where you're going to go and what you're going to buy or what you're going to need. And I 
I firmly believe, like I believe that there is an an unpredictability to the human spirit. Mm-hmm. And, you know, I'm going to, I am current, I'm getting tired of the personalized choices. I want to be able to have this kind of conversation with Andrea today to really like, what's the spontaneous serendipitous thing that can just pop up that only happens because these two wonderful humans got together to have a conversation and it wasn't fed to me by an algorithm. Like I'm real. And so this ability that we're going to have of how do we truly connect and be more human in our work and um, how do we uh, reconnect Mm. and energize our human spirit is going to be the thing that's going to differentiate ourselves. Um, I firmly believe that because with chat GBT, like everything's going to be the same the same. And we'll be dull to that. We'll be dull to that. And so how do we do this? And I I do believe this way of showing up, um, you know, transformational selling. It's, it's, It's a solution to that. It's a solution to that. Yeah, absolutely. I think so too. I don't know. There's definitely, um, things out there that are going to be trans remain transactional, but Mm -hmm. the ability to connect deeply as humans to be curious about each other and excavate mm-hmm. things that n- no algorithm can um, to follow intuition. And um, I don't know, like I, when you were talking about that, the, the word that came to mind was magic. I mean, mm-hmm. it's it's there's just something really special about that. And so I think you're right. I think that ha- you have to be also. Even in the midst of that, I, I know for myself, sometimes I, people love talking to me and, you know, I make them think and all that kind of stuff. But if I don't circle back around to the transactional, <laughs> then that can be a problem. Um, so even I think that the, what you're talking about with, you know, bringing the transactional, relational and transformational all together, um, that they build on one another, not just you can do one or the other. I think that that's really, really important to the, to the yeah. selling picture. Yeah. And I would say like, you know, we, we use them at various points of, in the conversation and the relationship uh, where we haven't spent enough time is the transformational. So I would venture to say, you know, go like the trend, the transaction is what we're very familiar with. And it's our comfort zone because we know our product and our service and our solution. And we know, you know, what benefits and features come with it. Um, resist as much as possible leading with that. Your clients do not care about that until they know that you understand their needs and what they're looking for. And so, you know, focusing on the relational, so building that rapport and relationship and trust and the transformation, what are they actually looking for and who do they want to be, do and have? And then does your solution transaction help fit the bill? Like, and then you get to make the match. It's like, okay, ideal. This is the client and this is the transformation they're seeking. And this is what they want at the end. And then you get to look at your products and services and say, okay, yep, that fits that here. And that fits that here. And then you get to make that beautiful recommendation and show them how it'll help them get more of what they want. Hmm. Okay. Let's, let's, uh, let's talk again about these, this idea of interruption. Um, I'm, I'm going to page 51 mm-hmm. where you talk about the old brain and the new brain. Mm-hmm. Um, And I'm going to read a quote from you. Your old brain stores memories of past events and uses them as a reference point to determine the most efficient way to respond to current circumstance based on your past stored experiences. Your old brain strives for efficiency, comfort, and certainty. So even if the old way of responding didn't get the result you were looking for, your old brain will put safety ahead of any of your new brain's desires. Tell us about the difference between the old brain and the new brain and how to use the new brain more. <laughs> so um, the old brain is our ability to, you know, we prefer status quo. We want stability, certainty. And one thing I'm noticing also, I don't know if it's um, the wisdom with age <laughs> or AKA aging, 
I, I believe that the older we get, the more certainty we crave. I, I look at my elderly parents and there are a lot of changes that they're experiencing and the more change they experience um, with their flailing health and their abilities, the more certainty they want. For instance, um, you know, there's lunches at a certain time and if it's five minutes late, like it just spins, spins them out. And I'm like, ah, and it's because they've, so much change has happened and obviously their own sense, you know, control and autonomy and all those things have also affected them. But if you look at even the last few years of the experiences we've all had with the amount of fear, the pandemic, um, economic uncertainty, inflation, so much stuff going on, even if you love change and you're a creative, uh, the way our uh, human brain is wired, especially with the amount of uncertainty really be cognizant of you will lean more to status quo and staying wanting some form of certainty in your life before you embark on that change. Then we've got this new brain, which is more in our prefrontal cortex, and that's our thinking brain, our analyzing brain, our decision brain. And we only have a certain amount of energy uh, that we're, you know, that we can expend in that brain. And those are the things where it's like, you know, I want to launch a new product. I want to launch a podcast. I got to write a book. Or, and so we're thinking about these wonderful things that we want to be doing. Uh, I got to sell. Unfortunately, what happens is if we've got too much fear or too much ambiguity going on, even those great ideas, even those great projects, even if they're going to set us up for a better outcome, we will hold ourselves back and rationalize why now is not a good time, why you should wait or it's too expensive or you're too busy and all of that narrative starts to happen. So those are the the distinctions between the old and the new brain. Um, when it comes to selling, it it also applies because often we could be selling in a old way, meaning We've been just doing the same way. We're not getting any different results, but we're scared or afraid, or even if we want to put ourselves out there, um, our new brain with those big and nice, good ideas can, uh, they can falter if we've got too much fear energy. And so the other thing I want to point out, not only are you working this way, your clients are. So that's right. Oftentimes, right? Oftentimes we're thinking, oh, our clients aren't making a decision because, or they're not choosing us because they've gone with to the competition. And more often than not, and this was a, um, a statistic done by Salesforce, they had noted that 50 to 60% of sales result in no decision than a client choosing the competition. And the other alarming one was if you're selling financial services or insurance, um, it was as high as 80 to 90%. And so you've got these, you know, pipeline opportunities and we're worried that, oh, someone else is going to take them. Actually, your client is also very comfortable with status quo. Mm -hmm. And the idea of changing, um, it ruffles a lot of feathers, even if the outcome is going to be better than if, uh, if we didn't change. Hmm. So any thoughts on how to help clients move out of indecision? Hmm. So, uh, yeah, yeah, absolutely. So moving them out of indecision is this continual, um, when we call, we talk about it in, um, so in the transformational selling framework, it's all about helping them understand where they're at in their in their journey. I was going to say a sales journey, buying journey, but their transformation journey, let's call it their transformation journey. And really identifying like, where are they right now? Are they in a place that they're just uncovering what they really, really want and that you're helping them with that conversation? And it's these micro commitments. So we're, we're not going from A to Z right away. But we're getting them to, you know, yes, I, 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 these are my needs. And yes, I'm committed to addressing these needs. And, and from there, you know, how important if you change, uh, what's the benefit? If you don't change, what's the consequence? 
And I also believe in, you know, if we're going to, um, as transformational sellers, look at ourselves from going from comfort to beyond, from the art to edge and to beyond, how do we help our clients also use that methodology? It might be a big leap from going from, you know, zero to, to, to 180 like that real quick. But what would be some of the small steps that they can start taking to move towards the outcome that they want? Mm. And it's it's reminding him of the destination. You know, I think you both of us are familiar, like with the hero's journey. Like we're not there to save the day for our clients. We're helping them walk to the outcome that they're looking to create. And it is reminding them, like, is this important to you on a scale of one to 10? How important is it? How will you feel? What will you be able to do? All those wonderful questions if they get the outcome that they're looking for. Um, and then what are they willing to do? And that's the hardest part is the the action and the commitment to moving forward. Hmm. I like I, I think you're right. Those micro commitments are super important. Um, think of when you think about the other habits, what other habits do you want us to make sure that we cover today to the people have a have what they need to um, I don't know, to, to move forward today, but then also to get the book. I, I certainly think that anybody that's enjoying this conversation should um, pick up transformational selling. Um, but yeah, what other habits would you like to highlight? So I would swing right to the end. <laughs> um, and the the one that I think we're not doing enough of is uh, the offer a day habit, mm. meaning extending yourself and your work and uh, your ability to add value to someone in some way every day. And that offer a day does not always mean that you're inviting someone to work with you um, every day. Uh, that'd be great. Uh, but there is an invitation to, you know, help them think about something, maybe set up a call to have a conversation, maybe share an article or some, maybe a blog that you wrote and some maybe personalized insights. But there is some form of exchange that you are putting yourself out there and making an offer to a client to think about their problems in a new way, interact with you to talk about those challenges, inviting them to work with you so you can help them get more of what they want. And so a lot of our work is about Fear, which is the first thing we started talking about, is going to do everything it can to hold you back. And the antidote to fear is action. Getting outside of our head, putting ourselves back into our heart and using our hands to help people, help people, help people. Um, you selling stuff isn't about the stuff you're selling. It's about what you said, the magic that we get to create with our clients and uh, the importance of you getting your work out there. Mm -hmm. Um, Finca, where can people find your book? Can they, where can they find you and your podcast and all the things? Yeah. So you can visit me at uh, www.transformationalselling.com. You can learn more about uh, the Transformational Selling book. Uh, if you're interested in uh, Transformational Selling for your sales team, feel free to reach out. You can learn more about my programs there. And the podcast as well. And uh, the book available on Amazon. So go on, grab a copy and uh, email me. Let me know how it was and what you got out of it. And then please, I'd love if you could rate and review the book uh, to help others uh, find it so we can really start creating a culture of, uh, of really being in the interest of uh, that service-based, heart-centric, transformational selling nature. Mm. And my last question for you today is uh, what last piece of advice would you want to give somebody who wants to have a voice of influence? Mm. The best is be yourself, but figure out who, like find, find that voice. And um, let me go with it. Be yourself, but how you find your voice of influence is by actually using it. Yeah, yeah, there you go. So you got to use it to figure out what it is. And, um, you know, kind of I, I've, I've been a strong proponent and teaching teacher of who are you? What's your authentic self? The best way of finding it is actually by sharing it with others and then they get to mirror it back to you. So if you want to uh, be and have a voice of influence, go out there and use it and you'll 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 see and 
have it uh, mirrored back to you. Mm. Well, thank you for being a voice of influence for our listeners. For me, appreciate it, Finca. And uh, yeah, appreciate you. Thank you. I appreciate you too.